Our scripture reading today comes from the book of John, chapter 12, starting in verse 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was they heard that he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Father, we are grateful that you did send your son to die for us, to go before us, to die as a ransom for our sins, Father. We are grateful for his sacrifice. and We pray today that you would give us a heart for the mission to proclaim the good news of what Jesus did for us, to set us free from our sin so that we can call him King Jesus. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. Well, good morning, Valley Life Church and everyone else that's listening in. We have learned that there are a lot of people tuning in both on Facebook and on YouTube uh, for these messages. We are at, this is our fourth week online at these different platforms and our second week in this series called Do You Believe as we get ready for Easter. And I just wanna acknowledge that I am preaching to a camera in an empty room and it's a little bit weird. It's weird that we've wiped down all the platforms and all the equipment trying to maintain social distance while we do this and a, and a clean environment while we do this. And it does make preaching just a little bit weird, but uh, it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's the message that's important. And preachers have preached in weird situations for forever. I've, we've all preached in weird situations. And I thought I would tell you about the first sermon I ever preached. So the first time I ever preached a sermon, um, I was about 18 years old. I had just graduated high school in Tampa, Florida. I was going from Tampa, Florida up to South Carolina after I graduated high school and uh, was going to go to college in South Carolina. And on the way, the plan was for me to stop off at a church there in North Florida and, and do the music. At that time, I just did music in churches, and I was going to do the music service for this church. And I don't know who got the wires crossed, um, who missed a detail. Maybe it was me, or maybe it was uh, my dad who had kind of set this up for me to do. But somewhere in there was a miscommunication because the pastor thought that I was going to do the music service and then preach a sermon. And... And I was not in the, that impression at all. So when we, when we started, he shook my hand. He said, so you're going to be doing the music. And then after that, you're going to preach. And I had a moment of decision. I had previously felt like God had called me to preach as a much younger guy when I was 14 or 15 years old, but I'd never really done anything about it. And here I was, here I was standing in front of this guy who said, you're going to preach today. In just a few minutes, you're going to preach the sermon. And I had to decide right then and there. And I had not even settled yet in my heart if I was going to live for Jesus in college. I was going to continue on and drive up to South Carolina and go to college. And I didn't know if I was going to live for Jesus or not. And here I am about to make this decision. And he says, so you're going to preach the sermon after the music, right? And I said, yes, I am. And I had a few minutes to prepare and I thought, what in the world am I going to say? Now, that's probably not a good idea, but that is exactly what happened. I got through at the music service and I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to tell them everything I know about David. I felt like I knew more about David than anybody else in the Bible. I'm going to tell them every story I know about King David. And these people sat there. They listened to me talk about David as a shepherd boy, David killing a giant, David as a good king, David as a bad king, David as the tiger king. I told them everything I could possibly think of about David. I said, David was a good dad. David was a bad dad. I just gave them the whole load. I wore myself out, giving all these people everything I knew about David. I sat down after it was all over, I looked at my watch and I had preached seven total minutes. It's difficult preaching your first sermon. And what I'm going to tell you today is you are going to preach your first sermon, every one of you. And we know that there are a thousand people watching this and you are gonna preach your first sermon Easter Sunday. Now, I don't know if it's a good idea or a bad idea for someone to preach their first sermon on Easter Sunday, but that's what's going to happen. That's what Valley Life is doing today 
and next week. Today, I'm preparing you, getting you ready. I'm letting you know you have a week to prepare for you to go for your first sermon. All the ladies in here, all the men in here, we're all going to preach our first sermons Easter Sunday. And the thing I'm doing today is walking you through a part of John chapter 12, which is where we'll be in the text today. I'll walk you through John chapter 12, and next week we'll also uh, use that sermon to get you ready to preach your first sermon. So this is the fourth week of online services. It's the fourth week we haven't been able to office up here in the building, and the results, frankly, have been terribly encouraging to me. If there's a sliding scale of how churches operate, some churches lean on the pastor and the staff to do a lot of things, and some churches don't. And we're on the other side. We see the staff and pastors as those who get you ready to do the ministry. We're on that side of the scale. But this coronavirus, this uh, COVID-19, the restrictions, um, the quarantine has pushed us even further. You are doing the work of ministry at a scale I have never seen before. And I could not possibly be more encouraged by that. We really are losing control. Thank God. We're losing control of the scope of the ministry of all of the Valley Life churches because the members and attenders, those of you who say I'm a part of Valley Life Church, you are doing the work of the ministry. And sermons like these into cameras on Thursday, then shot out on, on a Sunday, they're just encouraging you, preparing you, and sending you out to do the real work of the ministry. And this next step of you preaching the sermon yourself and delivering the message to the person that needs it from your lips to their ears is just the next logical step of releasing ministry into the hands of the body of Christ, into the hands of his people. You are going to do this because you are a church. And what I'm doing is preparing you for it. And what I'll do next Sunday, uh, what is typically and supposedly the biggest day where you get everybody to come together in one place. And we love doing that. We've loved doing that for the eight other times we've had Easter service. This Easter service is gonna be different. And here's the idea. Rather than trying to gather up a thousand people to hear me preach four different sermons, or what, rather than trying to gather up tons and tons of people to hear all the Valley of Life preachers preach all the different sermons on one big day, how about this? Instead of one sermon to a thousand people, how about thousands of sermons from your lips to your hearers' ears? And here's going to be the big idea of your sermon that you preach on Easter Sunday, one week from the day you hear this. Here's your big idea. It's not about what Jesus does to parties that makes us want to repent and believe him. It's what Jesus does to funerals. You have a story to tell about a funeral. You have been there. You have your own funeral story to tell. I once was dead and now I'm alive. And we're gonna see that in our text today. But what you'll see in this text, it's your story too. You have a very similar story. It's what Jesus does to funerals like this one and funerals like yours. That I was dead. I went through my own personal funeral, but he lifted me up and made me alive. And, and every time you've seen a baptism, in any church or this Valley Life Church, you are more and more prepared to say, I've seen him do it many times. He did it to me. I once was dead and now I'm alive. I've seen other people's baptisms that said, I once was spiritually dead and now I am spiritually alive. I was there. You can ask me about it. I can talk about it. You are prepared for your Easter sermon. And that's going to be the big idea of your sermon, that it's not what Jesus does at parties that makes us want to serve him and love him, repent of our sins and believe in him. It's what he does to funerals. And if you were going to tweet out, if you were going to make a tweet right now of what your sermon is going to be next week, it would be something like this. Jesus did not come to make your life better. He came to make dead things alive. Jesus didn't come to make things better. He came to make dead things alive. Your friends are dead, spiritually dead, separated from God, on their way to hell and judgment. They are dead. This is as close to heaven. This COVID-19 pandemic is as close to heaven 
as many of your friends will ever be. And this is as close to hell as you will ever be. And if you were going to tweet out the point, it's that Jesus didn't come to just make your life better. He came to make dead things alive. And because of what's going on all around us, you probably have seen it. I've certainly seen it. If you haven't noticed, I've been paying attention and people are listening like never before in my 45 years of caring about people's spiritual antennas. I've never seen people listen like they're listening now. I've never seen people open like they're open now and asking questions like they ask now. So we're going to take the next two weeks to get you ready. And here's how we're going to do it. Right there in your home, as you're sitting there, this sermon that we're already into here is going to prepare you to preach your sermon. This week in your community group, everything that you're going to be talking about in your community group, on your online Zoom call, your online Google Meetup, whatever it is, is to prepare each other. What are you going to say? Who are you going to talk to? What are you nervous about? is to prepare you for your sermon. And every video that we release, we've been, you've seen it, we've released a bunch of videos on Facebook just trying to encourage the brothers and the sisters, trying to um, prepare you to do the work of ministry with every song we release, with every encouraging Bible study we release. But this week, it's all about preparing you for your Easter sermon. And your job is to get that message to your friends. It would be one thing to say, hey, uh, my, my church is having an online service on Easter. You could make something on Facebook and invite the whole world to come to it. And that's only going to go so far. But from your lips to your family members' ears, from your lips to your friends' ears, I was dead and now I'm alive. Now that's a sermon that I want you to preach. So what am I literally asking you to do? I'm asking you to write out your testimony. I'm asking you to write out your resurrection story, and I want to help you do that today and next week. And I'll give you this format, okay? Here's the format that you're going to use. You'll be talking about it in community groups. We'll be releasing videos about it all week long, and it's the format that I encourage you to use Easter Sunday when you preach it. It's this. It's before, how, and now. Before. What my life was like before Jesus. Before Jesus, this is what my life was like. And how how I took the step to repent of sin and believe in Jesus. And now, what my life is like now that I've repented of sin and believe in Jesus. Because we know if you haven't experienced a transformation in your life, you have not yet met Jesus. You may have gotten moralistic or religious or found a church or something, but if it hasn't changed your life, then you're not yet a Christian. You haven't really met the resurrected Christ. So I want to prepare you guys to preach that sermon before how and now. But what do I think you need to know first? Shouldn't, shouldn't I know some stuff before I start preaching my Easter sermon? Yeah, I think you should know this. I think you should know that the normal pattern of Christian history, I'm talking about all of Christian history, the normal pattern is not for people to come to faith when people like me preach the good news. That's not the normal way. The normal way is when people like you People who are a part of the church rather than leading the church go out there and say, before, how, and now. Before I met Jesus, how I met Jesus, and now that I've met Jesus. I once was dead, and now I'm alive, and here's how it happened. When you tell those stories, when you tell resurrection stories or testimonies or what we're calling your Easter sermon, that's when people become Christians. That's when people uh, come to faith in Christ. It's when people who have witnessed a resurrection tell their story people who have seen that it happened to me and they tell that story. That's when people come to faith. So let's put away the idea that you're going to send a link to my sermon and then your dad is going to become a Christian. That's probably not the way it goes. It probably sounds a whole lot more like, dad, this is what happened to me. So I want you to know that, that that's the normal way. The second thing I want you to know is we want you to know that you have been empowered for this. I know you're scared. Different personalities are going to take this in different ways. Some of you guys, you love the camera and you're, you can't wait to go Facebook live and say what you've got to say. And now you have my permission to do it. Fantastic. I'm rooting for you. I hope it goes super well. I bet it will. And some of you are saying, are, are you serious? You really want me to be the spokesperson for Christianity for this friend in my life or for this family member? How am I going to do that? And what I want to say is you were made for this. Like, kicking a, a baby eagle out of the nest. You were literally created for this, 
even though you've never done it before. That little baby eagle has never done it before. And of course he's scared, but of course he was made for this. And if you are a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit of God inside of you. You have your own resurrection story. You know, Jesus, you were made for this. And I'm not going to take that from you and say, just bring them to to let them hear me speak. No, you are the speaker. You are the preacher. It's your story. So as you go through our text today, John chapter 12, here's what I want you to be feeling. What I want you to feel. Well, at a time when some businesses and organizations and even churches are understandably pulling back, slowing up, slowing down, whatever, we're expanding. We're pushing forward. We're opening up new avenues to ministry, trying to open up new doors into heaven for for more people. I want you to feel rather than wanting you to feel cared for, rather than wanting you to feel safe or secure. What I want you to feel, I want you to feel like an agent of the kingdom of God. Greater than safe or unsafe. Greater than feeling secure or insecure. Greater than even life or death. Christians are built for eternal matters. And what I want you to feel is the eternal adrenaline flowing through your veins. You were made for this. I know you may never have done anything like it before, but this is what you were made for. So what do I really want you to do? I want you to preach your sermon. I once was dead and now I'm alive. Before, how, and now. And I want you to expect with hope-filled, faith-filled expectancy that the whole world will come running to Christ. Your little corner of the whole world will come running to Christ. And you'll see that today in our text. So we're in John chapter John chapter 12. Hopefully you've had time to turn open to John chapter 12, verse 12 it says, "The next day the large crowd came, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem." So every story has a context, and here's the story, or here's the context for this story. Like we talked about last Sunday in the in the sermon, uh, Lazarus was dead. And then Jesus called him out of being dead. He raised him to life. And of course, news like that's going to travel fast. But it also travels fast in a a time and a place where Jerusalem, which was normally about 100,000 people, swelled up by 10 times that. So it goes from 100,000 to a million people because it's Passover. And people were gathered up to celebrate this big uh, religious festival. So everyone's in town. Plus, just days before, a man who was dead has now come back to life. So news travels fast in a time like that. And here's what I have observed in my lifetime. Christians, people who are paying attention to who is a Christian and who's not a Christian, people who have a heart to see more people enter the kingdom of heaven, there's just often some big moment that opens up certain people's hearts. And it can be, it could be good things, it can be bad things, it can be a change of location, I got a new job, I moved to a new city. It could be a brush with death. It could be something like we just, you know, we're starting to have our kids now. The first child was born. It could be the loss of someone close. But these changes in our life often open up people's hearts and minds to Christianity, to trusting in Jesus. And I've prayed for those things, man. I've prayed for good things or bad things or something, anything to happen to open up someone's ears to hear and their heart to believe. And that seems to be what's going on in this context there in Jerusalem. All these people are gathered up and news travels fast in a context like that. I mean, if you just think through what we're experiencing, how news travels so fast about this virus and about this pandemic, some, some of it true, some of it false. In this case, everyone is saying there, once, or there was a guy just a few days ago who was once dead and now he's alive and you can go talk to him. And you can go talk to the guy that raised him from the dead. Now we're in verse 13. So now that this news is travels fast, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And they want liberation. That's why they're saying he's going to be our king. Well, they already had a Caesar, Caesar over Rome and Rome over Jerusalem, Rome over the Jews. And of course they don't want that. They want their own king. They want to be able to go where they want to go, not be under... Uh, somewhat having to get permission from someone just to leave their house. And we've experienced some of that stuff. It's difficult when you can't do exactly what you want. And they think maybe this guy will be our liberation. If he's bringing people back from the dead, let's make him the king. And in verse 14, and Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it just as it is written. 
And then he goes on to quote what is written in the very next verse. But first, I want to show you that he gets on a donkey and he rides it into town. And any astute, you know, thinking, Bible-based Jewish person of this day might be able to say, what is this guy doing? This would be like a, a dog whistle to anyone who really knows their Bible, because there is that verse that is quoted there in 15 saying, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. And now this guy, who everyone is thinking, could this be our new king to throw off the shackles of Rome? He gets up on a colt, on this you know, baby donkey, on this small donkey, and rides it into town. And it's the it, it goes back to something over here in your Bible in the book of Zechariah, written 500 years before these events took place, where it says this, Zechariah wrote this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he. But then this, humbled and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, ever since Zechariah wrote that, again, 500 years before Jesus was born, rabbis and, and scholars wondered, why would Zechariah be moved to write it like that? To say, behold, your king is coming, and he comes in majesty riding on camels. That would make sense if he said he comes in, in power riding on an elephant or on this great war horse. All that would have made sense. But it's really weird and had always been thought of as super weird that, he, that Zechariah says he's going to come. He brings righteousness. He's going to uh, bring peace. He's going to uh, make a lot out of, out of Jerusalem. And he comes in riding on a baby donkey. And what Jesus is doing here is two things at once. By crawling up on that donkey and riding it into town while people are praising him and saying he's going to be the next king, He's fulfilling Zechariah's prophecy. He knew what he was doing. He got up on that donkey because he said, yeah, that's right. I am the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And he's hinting for anybody who'll pay attention. And John later says, I started paying attention after it happened. But for anyone who'll pay attention, he's hinting at the fact that his rule will be one that comes about by his crucifixion. His rule and his taking over as king will not be one that comes in power, but one that comes in humility. But if you think about it, he's saying this. Listen, if I just came in and made war against the Romans and liberated you from Rome, you would still have your bigger problems. You would still die. You would still die in your guilt of sin. You would still have the problem of a meaningless existence. Jesus is saying, I'm going to be more than a king. I'm going to be more than a political liberator. I'm going to, save, I'm, I'm going to do more than saving you from, from Rome. Or in our case, maybe you could say, he's going to do more than saving us from getting sick. He's going to do more than saving the world from a pandemic. Even if he wiped away all of our fears over what's going to happen in the next eight days to two weeks, he could wipe away all that and we would still be suffering from our bigger problems, our meaningless existence. What about our guilt? What about our shame of things that have happened to us and things that we have done to other people? Our fears are more than sickness. They're more meaningful than sickness. Our big enemies are universal enemies. And by him saying, I'm going to get up on this donkey, and my rule will start in humility when I lay my life down to free the people from the real enemies. In verse 16, John said, His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. So he says it was hard to understand when it happened, but in hindsight, we could see it. Jesus is going to have to die to free us from more than just Rome. In verse 17, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. Now that sounds just super odd the way it's written here in the English translation. But it does make a lot of sense if you think about it. There was this crowd that had seen Jesus pull Lazarus out of a grave. And now everybody, just a few days later, comes into Jerusalem. What was a town of 100,000 is now a million. And then there's this pocket of people who said, I'm telling everybody I know 
that Lazarus was dead. That guy right there who's in town to celebrate this thing, he was dead. I saw him. He was in the grave for four days. And then that guy right there, he's the one that raised him. That's what it says. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness, which simply means they told everybody and they would not be stopped. And people are starting to listen. People are really starting to listen to Jesus now, not because he had walked on water, not because he preached a fantastic sermon on the mount, not because he was willing to speak truth to power, and all those things are true, and he did every one of them. But they're starting to listen now because he brought the dead back to life. I once was dead, and now I'm alive. Now in verse 18, the reason why the crowd went out to meet him was that they, had that, that they heard he had done this sign. There was no stopping it now. If, if word started to spread that a man brought another man back after he was dead for four days, and both of those guys are here in town and you can just go talk to them, there is no stopping the spread of Jesus' fame. Of course, the Romans tried to stop it. They didn't want anything like this bubbling up under their rule. And of course, the religious leaders of the Jews, the, called the Pharisees, they tried to stop it. They didn't want any of their power being taken away, but they were helpless. They tried to stamp it out, to eradicate it, to extinguish it, but you couldn't. The more they tried, the further it spread. It infected country after country and culture after culture. And you know that it's true because we sit here in Phoenix, Arizona, of all places, still worshiping this man who was God. There is no cure for Christianity. Once it starts, it cannot be stopped because death cannot stop it. In fact, death and resurrection is what started it. And if death won't stop it, what in the world will? And this is why you have to. This is why you must preach your Easter sermon. Because it's not what Jesus does at parties that makes us repent and believe. It's what he does at funerals. It's death brought to life. So it's, in other words, it's not what, how Jesus improves our lives. It's how he makes us new after we've been dead. This is where some people kind of get confused. This is where some people start to think that they have to be awesome and they have to live an awesome life or a very religious life or a very fulfilled life in order to tell people about Jesus. But that's not the content of our message. The content of our message is not, I once was not awesome, but he made me awesome and I can prove it. That's not our message at all. Our message is, I was dead and Jesus is awesome. He brought me back to life. So right now, while you're watching this, me, this is what I'm doing. He brought me back to life right now. That's what Lazarus would say to you right now. That's what John in his writing here is saying to you. We're not saying I was a loser and he made me a winner. We're saying that we have, were dead and it was as close to heaven as we would ever get was living in this world. But he has made us alive. And now this life is as close to hell as we will ever come. The text says that the whole world has gone after him. And that's what I want. And that's what I want you to expect is that your corner of the whole world, when you tell your story, may very well, you couldn't blame them if they did, if they all went after him. There was a time right after we had started this church that uh, I invited someone to come and they said, hey, I do want to come to your church, but I want to let you know, it's not just because everybody else is going there. And I remember thinking, what are you talking about everybody else? There's less than 100 people attending this church. There's hardly anybody else here. But in, in her mind, she was just kind of letting me know that basically everybody I hang out with, the, my whole world is doing this. And I don't want you to think that that's the reason, but I, I don't want to come. But that's the thing I want you to think about is for her, her whole world had gone after Jesus. And that's what, it's what I want for you. And that's what you see here in verse 19. The Pharisees, these religious leaders who don't want to lose any of their religious power and are seeing it slip from their hands, the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. And I think they're just sort of putting each other down. Hey, your plans aren't working. Well, your plans aren't working either. Well, you see you're gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. And there is a way when Jesus comes to town and it happened to these Pharisees, there's a way. When you hear the message or you see its truth or when Jesus comes into town, 
for you to gain nothing. And that the Pharisees are saying that that's what happened to them. And the way that it happened to them is when you don't want Jesus to take anything away from you, when you can't give up what he wants to take away. And the Pharisees knew if the whole world goes after him and if I go after him, I will lose. And there's a place in John where they say that. They say, we'll lose our position, we'll lose our power, we'll lose our place and our privilege. And if you don't want to lose anything to Jesus and you will not let him be in charge, whether he comes into your proximity, whether he comes into town or not, if you won't surrender to him, you will gain nothing. And there's another way to gain nothing. It's when the Jewish crowd's way of gaining nothing. They only wanted what Jesus would give them. They didn't want Jesus and they didn't want him to rule. They wanted what he would do, what he would give, what, he, what they would acquire if he ruled. And in neither case did they get what Jesus can bring, which is himself. But then there is a way to gain everything when Jesus comes to town. I want you to hear that. If you are not a Christian, there is a way to gain everything when Jesus comes to town. And it's this. It's from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 9. And it's what ends up happening in this story. And I'll tell you about it next week on Easter Sunday when I preach my sermon. And mine will go out online. And it's this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that's a surrender. That's no matter what he takes, I surrender. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, from death to life, a resurrection story, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So I'm gonna ask you right now, have you become a Christian like that? A lot of people will say that they're a Christian and they mean I'm, I'm not Muslim and I don't, I don't adhere to the sayings of Confucius. Does that make me a Christian? I'm, I'm American. Does that make me a Christian? I think I'm a Christian because I know other Christians. I think I'm a Christian because I'm friends with Brian or I have another pastor friend that's a Christian. And I'm saying, no, none of that. I'm saying, have you become a Christian like that? To confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Have you become a Christian like that? And if not, do you want to? Right now, I know we're online here. You're watching it on YouTube or you're watching it on Facebook, but you gotta take a step. If you want to be a Christian like that, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you need to take a step. And one step that you might take is you can just write the word Jesus right there in the comments. And I am, now I will get in touch with you. I'll use the social media. I'll get in touch with you and help you take steps to know what to do next since you want to be a Christian like that. And if you're already a Christian, now's the time. We're at the end of my sermon and now's the time to start preparing yours. You are the preacher this coming Easter. You are going to be the one from your lips to your friend's ears to say what your life was like before Jesus. How did you repent of sin? and believe in Jesus? And what is your life like now that you have repented of sin and believe in Jesus? I love you. I'll see you Easter Sunday.